Greetings. I'm Keith, reporting to you from the Bonehenge Whale Center in Beaufort, North Carolina. We're not open yet for public tours or visitation or programming. We can't be open until we have water and sewer and a final inspection, but I'm pleased to report to you that as I am speaking, utilities contractors are outside working on the hookups. What I'm excited to do today is attempt to give you a little tour of some of the highlights, some of the projects and specimens and other features inside of this facility. This shows you a panoramic I took one evening of the inside of the Bonehenge Whale Center. A lot going on in there, I'll walk you through some of it. Uh, but what you see are some prog projects that we're involved in, some displays, some artwork, second floor balcony, and let us proceed. Walking in, probably the most striking thing is the pair of right whale mandibles to your right as you enter and you will have an opportunity to walk under and touch these mandibles, which are lower jaws, from a North, North Atlantic right whale that stranded in Nags Head in 2011. It was an adult female. She had been seen uh, a few weeks before this, when she stranded dead um, with a young calf. Her carcass came ashore, it wasn't in great shape, but it did have evidence of having been struck by a ship and having been entangled. The two, two major conservation issues, killers of large whales. I'll show you a picture of her carcass. So that is the source of the mandibles. And we also have the skull here, uh, you can see our co-workers standing near the tail for size. Again, it's a North Atlantic right whale. And I, uh, sometimes it gets depressing, but I like it when I can make some sort of display that addresses a conservation issue, such as this one and, uh, and the mandibles. Straight ahead when you walk in is this poster. This poster shows all of the 90 something species of whales on earth as of about 10 years ago when the poster was printed. One has gone extinct, one's on its way to extinction. One has been discovered since then. So there's a lot of changing, uh, changes going on in whale taxonomy, uh, some good, some tragic. But here's what I want to show you about the poster. All the baleen whales are facing to the right. So the biggest animal on earth is the biggest baleen whale. It's a blue whale. It's on the upper left there. In the center is a humpback whale, which is a baleen whale. Baleen whales lack teeth. Uh, the humpback whale is what we see most often from the shores of North Carolina. All the toothed whales are facing to the left. The largest tooth whale being the sperm whale in the upper right of this poster. And near the rostrum, the tip of the snout of the, uh, the humpback whale in the center is a small toothed whale called a bottlenose dolphin. And that is the one we see most often along the coast in the sounds and tidal creeks and rivers. Uh, it's a bottlenose dolphin. But here's the thing. I'm going to circle all of the toothed whales that we have documented in North Carolina, either through verifiable live sightings or from dead strandings on the beach. And there they are. It includes the sperm whale, dwarf and pygmy sperm whales, several species of beaked whales, two species of pilot whales, many species of dolphins, and four or five species of beaked whales. 
That's a lot of diversity. Now, I am going to circle all the baleen whales that we have documented in Carolina. We have seen the blue, the fin, the say, the brutus, minke, the humpback. I have an X through the gray whale because the North Atlantic gray whale went extinct, we believe, in the 1700s, presumably because of hunting. And now, this image is going to get very sloppy because I'm going to combine them. And I've circled all the cetaceans we have documented in North Carolina, 34 species. That's more than any other state. That is more than all of the states to our north combined. That is more than all of the states to our south combined, including Florida that has much longer coastline and includes the Gulf of Mexico. I'm not bragging. I would work hard to prove me wrong. But this is impressive diversity. And on top of that, the abundance of some of these species is very high in North Carolina. So I want visitors of Bonehenge, I want you to understand that there's something special about North Carolina and whales. And, and the diversity is really what um, is most impressive to me. The list of marine mammals we have documented is shown here, and you can find it on the web at the website above the list. Straight ahead is the skeleton of a Gervais beaked whale. And before I go on, I just want to mention really what the source of all this material is. The skeletons and bones and um, teeth I'm showing you. I'm part of a network of marine biologists and educators, volunteers, veterinarians called the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Every coastal state has one. And we get the reports of every dead or dying or entangled marine mammal. And as I just showed you, it could be uh, one of up to 34 species of cetaceans, but it also includes in North Carolina, potentially four species of seals and the West Indian manatee. So it's the Marine Mammal Stranding Network that uh, is a big collaboration and absolutely critical to what we do. Gervais beaked whale. This was a sub-adult that's stranded in Salvo, North Carolina. There it is on the beach. When possible, we ask a veterinarian to please uh, take x-rays of the pectoral fins and maybe other features so that we can uh, get those right. First, we, you know, we determine if it is a good candidate for us to actually keep to study, to share, and possibly build a skeleton. And we treating the bones in a five day soak of hydrogen peroxide is typically part of the process after we've cleaned the bones, but before we seal them. Hydrogen peroxide dissolves protein, kills bacteria, and lightens the bone color a bit, as shown in the photo on the right, where the left scapula, which happens to be on the right side, is untreated, and the right scapula, the lighter one on the left side, uh, has been treated in hydrogen peroxide. And we had determined that this was a good specimen to preserve, to build a skeletal display, because we were aware of no Gervais beaked whales on display, complete skeletons. And so now this one is in the Bonehenge Whale Center. And it's here in Bonehenge. And this young boy traveled quite a bit. Here he is at the North Carolina Aquarium at Pine Knoll Shores. He spent some time on display at Duke Marine Lab. Here he is, he uh, spent a couple years at Jeanette's Pier in Nag's Head. And then we finally brought him back to Bonehenge. 
Also, when you walk in, you will see this very large work of art that artist Karen Hatman named the Spirit Whale. She created this to both honor the sperm whale echo that's currently on display at the North Carolina Maritime Museum, and also to help inspire and motivate an army of volunteers who helped with that project. So it's in the Pacific Northwest style of art. There's a lot of symbolism and cultural significance to this. Uh, it's not the species they typically represent, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, but she really wanted to customize this. And I'm not gonna go through all the details because she actually wrote it up and I will present to you what she wrote. So if you wanna learn about the details of that work of art, uh, there they are, courtesy of Karen Hatman. As you step through the right whale mandibles, you will be walking on a rug. And the rug features our county seal. We are in Carteret County, North Carolina. This rug is at the entrance of every county building. The seal is on every county vehicle, every county piece of stationery, every county website, on the outside of every county building. And what's interesting here is that someone once upon a time thought right whales were significant enough to this county to actually feature on the county seal. And that's a pair of right whales. How do I know? Because right whales are the only cetacean that we have in North Carolina that um, lacks a dorsal fin. They have no dorsal fin. And they were hunted offshore and they're also hunted from shore-based whaling as well. North Atlantic right whales currently highly endangered. Whew. Lots going on here. I'm not gonna go through everything, but I wanna show you a few highlights, the mural on the floor and the sperm whale mandibles above it. Uh, so let's see what we have here. This mural, Nan Bowles painted on the floor and it reflects some of our local dolphins. I know they're local because they have distinct dorsal fins and we know them individually through a process called photo identification, where we identify individual dolphins by the scars and notches that they acquire on their dorsal fins. From top to bottom, it's butterfly, onion, fringe, and fringe's baby, Frankie. And we photograph those, uh, at least those three adult dolphins, dozens and two cases, uh, hundreds of times here in Beaufort. And then on the wall next to this mural, is a bottlenose dolphin dorsal fin photo ID challenge. And if you visit, I will ask you to look at the artwork on the floor and try to find any of those three adult dolphins on this display. And if you can make a match of two fins of the same animal, the red light goes on. And it's just an interactive game that a volunteer put together, which I think is terrific. And if you want to, try the challenge on the web. It's, this game is actually on the web. I am going to show you the website. So at the capelogastudies.org website, you can play this bottomless dolphin dorsal fin photo ID challenge. Good luck. I wouldn't give you anything easy. And above the dolphins on the floor mural, are a pair of sperm whale mandibles or lower jaws. Sperm whales generally only have erupted teeth in the lower jaws and all the teeth are in place. And this was a stranding on Oak Island uh, several years ago, three years ago. And my wife, Vicki Thayer, who also coordinates the Marine Mammal Stranding Network in our region, I have connections. Um, asked me if I wanted the whole skeleton. I didn't have the time or the money or the space uh, at the time, but she did bring back the mandibles with the teeth. So we buried them and exhumed them and cleaned all the teeth and cleaned and sealed the bones and made this display and uh, put each tooth in its original socket and put it on display here. And it's hinged 
And if you look at my image talking to you, you will see these jaws coming down. And uh-oh, I hope he doesn't bite. But there it is right here. And we have it on a block and tackle with a pulley. Some of the teeth I did not glue in. So you'll have an opportunity to actually handle a real tooth from a sperm whale. And these teeth are fascinating. They blew my mind because they were so huge. Why do I think they're huge? I have seen bigger. Because it was about a 30 foot, 31 foot whale. And Echo, the sperm whale at the Maritime Museum is 33 and a half feet. So this whale was two and a half feet smaller than Echo. And it not only had bigger teeth, it had more teeth. Oh, wait, this next slide, I think. Yes, there it is, okay. So the top tooth is tooth number R9 from Echo. And the picture of Echo is to the right of the tooth. The bottom tooth is tooth number R9, same species, same position in the jaw as Echo from this Oak Island whale. And the difference is very striking. So, um, so anyway, might not be unusual, uh, individual variation, but it's a big difference in the two teeth. And of course, the bottom whale, we're pretty sure was much, or at least a little bit older than Echo, which might explain larger and more worn teeth. I hope that makes sense. Oil. Why were whales hunted? Primarily for the oil. So we've been collecting oil from different species, from different body parts of whales to study and display it. And here are some samples I'm showing you. And the oil, depending on the body part, serves the whale differently, either insulation or sound reception or sound production or things we don't understand. And humans use the different oils for different reasons as well. Jaw oil um, served to lubricate watches and, and guns and spermaceti lubricated heavy equipment. And some of it is liquid at room temperature. Some doesn't get solid when it's cold. Spermaceti in the middle is hard at room temperature. Uh, anyway, just uh, showing an example of oils. You recognize some of these bottles. Uh, left to a cracker, crackle, cracker barrel um, syrup bottles. But most of them are the mini travel airline tequila bottles. And I love those. They're perfect for storing and displaying the oil. So if any of you are tequila drinkers, I'd love the empties of those little tequila bottles. Uh, Cuervo 1800, I think it is. I don't care about the tequila. You can drink the tequila. Um, don't pour it out and waste it. But there, those are the bottles I'm looking for. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Captain Hugh Wild, good friend of mine, uh, donated these whaling tools that are on display in Bonehenge. This is the skeleton of a Rissos dolphin. A lot of these species you might not have ever heard of, and most North Carolinians haven't, but they are North Carolina. North Carolina wildlife. And I'd love for people to get a little bit familiar with the diversity and the names of these animals. Rissos dolphin, I mean, they're pretty abundant offshore and we often see them associated with bottlenose dolphins or pilot whales. You're not likely to see a healthy one close to the beach. They, they tend to be closer to the continental shelf edge. Rissos dolphin, very long pectoral fins and uh, typically only four pairs of teeth, and those teeth are only in the lower jaws. This one was a live stranding. There it is on the beach with volunteers associated with the Outer Banks Marine Mammal Stranding Network and the Outer Banks Center for Wildlife Education standing by assisting. It died on the beach. Uh, this, this, there was not a complete Rizzo's dolphin anywhere in this country as far as I know. So uh, we decided that this would be a good candidate. It was super fresh, a good ne ne necropsy was done. So we went ahead and prepared the bones and built a skeleton.
Atlantic spotted dolphin, probably the most abundant cetacean on our continental slope off of North Carolina. And this species, again, you're not likely to see them alive and healthy near the beach, but starting four or five miles offshore in some areas, you start to see these predictably. And they're very abundant. And this one, uh, I'm not aware of any other Atlantic spotted dolphin skeleton on display anywhere on Earth, so we put this one together, prepared the bones, and actually it did a fair amount of traveling. Most significantly, it spent a couple years at the Smithsonian because the folks up there knew how unique this was and they wanted to display it and study it. Atlantic spotted dolphin, and that is the specimen dead on the beach as it was found on Ocracoke. And you can see the spots that earned its name, spotted dolphin. Three species of beaked whales. Beaked whales. Imagine most people in North Carolina haven't heard of them, but we have a lot of beaked whales offshore, but we don't know them very well. Although good people are studying them and teaching us a lot about them, especially associated with UNC Wilmington and Duke Marine Lab. And we contribute where we can. Left to right, it's Blainville's beaked whale and Gervais beaked whale and Cuvier's beaked whale, all named after famous marine mammal naturalists. Beaked whales, man, they're bizarre. Deep divers, squid eaters, among other things, things I suspect, and I know they tend to eat plastic, unfortunately. They only have two teeth. Those two teeth are only in the lower jaws, and as far as I know, those two teeth only erupt out of the gum in adult males. What's up with that? How do they feed? What are teeth even for? All interesting questions and good people are shedding some light on all of this. I want to show you a close-up of the skulls of those three in the same order. And those are the skulls. So the Blainville's on the left was an adult male, hence those tusks of teeth emerged out of the gum. They were visible. So I knew it was an adult male when I saw it on the dead on the beach. The middle one was a sub-adult male of a Gervais-speaked whale. You can see two little teeth a uh, few inches down from the tip of the jaw or up from the tip of the jaw. And they had not been erupted through the gum line. It was a subadult, wasn't old enough. And then the biggest one on the right was a mature Cuvier's beaked whale. The teeth on that one are way at the tip of the jaw. And they had they were not erupted out of the gum because it was a female. I hope you're following this and it makes sense. Uh, and not only is the position of the tooth distinctive for the species, and it really helps us identify them, sometimes they're hard to identify even when they're dead on the beach. And at sea, they're also challenging to identify. But the shapes of the tooth, teeth are different among the species. So now I'm going to show you a slide of one tooth from each of those three whales. So one of the two teeth from each of the three whales. Whew. See at this sense. So there they are. And you can tell that the shapes of the teeth are very different between the species. Beaked whales. We've got a lot to learn about beaked whales. Baleen. We do collect and study and display baleen from uh, many specimens that we encounter. This happens to be baleen plates, hundreds of them, from both sides of the upper jaw. That's where the baleen is in baleen whales, from a young minke whale that's stranded at Cape Lookout. This is a skull of a young minke whale that's stranded at Cape Look out. Dwarf sperm whale. It's a different species from a pygmy sperm whale, and they're both different species from the 
sperm whale or the great sperm whale, they have a lot of similarities, but they're about three different species. And dwarf sperm whale, this was an adult male, about seven feet long. It's about as big as they get. Uh, dwarf and pygmy sperm whales are challenging to distinguish at sea, and they're even challenging to distinguish if they're dead or dying on the beach, but we're getting better. And one very striking feature that you can see in this skeleton is the asymmetry in the skull. And the bone just looks like it's pushed to the left side or our right as we're looking at it. And that's predictable, it's typical, it's consistent uh, in this species. In fact, all toothed whales have asymmetrical skulls but extreme asymmetry is exhibited in the deeper divers for some reason. I'm not sure what the purpose of this asymmetry is, sound production, sound reception, something we don't understand. But anyway, I just wanted to show you that. Dwarf sperm whale uh, wasn't represented anywhere that I knew of on this, in this country, so we saved this one, but it was a live stranding. In fact, if you told me this story, I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> Their habitat is way offshore, and this adult male swam into Beaufort. There it is. Between Beaufort and Moorhead, there's a little area called Morgan Creek, and it's and there it is swimming alive. And it was a head scratcher. And I was pretty sure it was a dwarf sperm whale. Uh, and we kept an eye on it. People did vigils through the night, and by morning it was dead on the beach. I suspect that if it's so far out of its habitat, it's not in good shape. And so there it is. Anytime there's a stranding, we try to turn it into a teachable moment. And that's uh, my wife, Vicki, there down next to it, talking to the child. Um, and we buried this one for about two years and exhumed the bones and cleaned and sealed them and built the skeleton. This dwarf sperm whale skeleton also did a fair amount of traveling. Here it is at Coastal Carolina University in Conway, South Carolina on display. It also spent some time at the Smithsonian and also in the building of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Harbor porpoise stranded in 2014 up at Kill Devil Hills. And I've been wanting to rearticulate a harbored porpoise skeleton and display it next to the skeleton of a bottlenose dolphin to highlight the differences. A lot of people see the dolphins are around here and they call them porpoises. And I've never seen a live porpoise in North Carolina. Uh, and then there are lots of differences. So we, are, we started preparing the bones of this harbor porpoise that stranded there are the bones of that porpoise. And each of these projects require funding, uh, depending on the size and complexity. And, uh, it varies from about, you know, materials, labor, services, from about $10,000 for a small cetacean, like a porpoise or a dolphin, get to the larger whales, like this echo, the sperm whale, or a humpback I'm about to show you. It, uh, it gets a lot pricier, and uh, those are approximately $50,000 projects. I'm not, haven't launched any fundraisers yet. We want to get the building finished before we start trying to do fundraisers to uh, rearticulate these specimens. Two short fin pilot whales, adult female on the left, subadult male on the right. North Carolina strandings, we have the entire skeletons of both of them well-organized, cleaned, and in drawers. And speaking of conservation issues, this was a young dolphin that had a short, painful life. Veterinarians have studied this case with me, and here's what we came up with. This dolphin got entangled in monofilament line from a gill net when it was still nursing at about six months old, and the net entangled both of its jaws, both of its pectoral fins, or 
possibly two nets at different times in its life. That's what was more likely the conclusion. And it lived for about 12 months, growing really fast. And the picture on the lower left is the head of this dead dolphin. Eventually it succumbed to this entanglement. And you can see the line, you can see swelling, you can see infection. And the skin had grown around the entangling line. Just a horrible, horrible case. But it wasn't until we actually prepared the skull and took it out of the stinky bacteria-laden water a process called maceration that we used to prepare the skull. And it became an oh wow moment. And I want to share that with you. That is the skull. And you're not seeing bone that was cut by line. You're seeing bone of a fast growing young mammal growing around the entangling line that was killing it. So this tells an important story about a critical conservation message. The balcony is my favorite spot in the, uh, in the Bonehenge Whale Center because you can see things from different perspectives, which I think is great. And these are the lower jaws to that sperm whale. Uh, this one right behind me. <laughs> and the mural and the entrance. So I told you about many of the features there, the harbor corpus is there, the right whale mandibles, the spirit whale art, and the dry beaked whale, that's all at the entrance and the poster of, of cetaceans are all there. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like. One project we're working on is a long finned pilot whale. They occur in North Carolina, but this specimen uh, did not strand in North Carolina. It's from Massachusetts. It has an unusual and very interesting story that'll probably be the topic of another presentation, but I'm just showing you a few of the pictures of us working on the specimen, Nan working on the pectoral, pectoral fins or flippers on the upper left, Carrie's building their rib cage on the upper right. I'm working with the vertebrae and we drill holes in the vertebral centrums uh, through every vertebrae to run either a stainless steel rod or stainless steel pipe. And that ends up supporting not just the vertebrae, but everything else as well. And then the skull, actually that skull in the lower right with the open toothy jaws is right here, peering over my shoulder. And a couple other pictures of it. We've completed the skull. We've completed the rib cage of this long finned pilot whale. Meet Pitfall. Pitfall was named when she was alive. She was a 37 foot, three year old female humpback whale when she was struck by a ship and killed. And this is her entire skeleton. You can see the scapula or shoulder blades on the left. The top rack has both the left and the right ribs and the upper jaws and vertebrae are on the other shelves. And then the, on the bottom is the skull, the flippers, the lower jaw. So that's the entire skeleton of this young humpback whale. I'm gonna show you another picture of the skeleton. We laid out all the bones and my friend Bruce is lying next to it on the right side of the frame for scale. This is a big girl. And when she was struck by the ship and killed, her skull was broken in, broken in two pieces. And you can see those two pieces in the center of the photo. So I'm looking forward to working on this specimen, rearticulating re the skeleton. And actually the, this is, what we had in mind when we designed this building is to display the skeleton in here uh, and just tell the important conservation message about ship strikes killing large whales. Uh, this is going to take a fundraiser uh, and it's going to cost about $50,000 to do this work. And I don't want to launch a fundraiser till we're through with the building, but anyway, we'll, we'll be uh, seeking support to put together this impact whale or display somewhere, uh, hopefully in the Bonehenge Whale Center.
Okay, white beaked dolphin. This was a live stranding. This happened in 2015. I mentioned we documented 34 species of cetaceans in North Carolina. This was the 34th. Not only a new species for North Carolina, this was a new southern record for the species. And, uh, and it came ashore alive, died on the beach on Sand Dollar Island, which is here in Beaufort, part of the Rachel Carson, Nash, Rachel Carson National Estuarine Research Reserve. And uh, we took it to the NC State University's CMAS laboratory for a necropsy. Craig Harms and team radiographed the pectoral fins, that's what you're seeing here, for me, because we thought this would be a great specimen to prepare and rearticulate. Right now, it's, uh, the bones look great. We have them all, and they're in a, a drawer well organized. In this specimen, we buried in a shallow sandy grave for two years. So the three images shown here are the day a team of 10 or 12 of us worked together to exhume the bones. And you can see the condition of the bones when they come out of the grave. Uh, the most recent completed artistic contribution is this, and I can't help but smile every time I see this. I feel so privileged to be able to see this every day. Uh, mural artist and biologist Constance Sartor created this in January. And she had a team of supporters, and it's a Cuvier's beaked whale mom with her young calf. Very well done, durably, accurately. It's North Carolina wildlife. And it's uh, on an interior wall by the entrance to the Bonehenge Whale Center. And when she completed it, she said, Keith, do you have any more of that glow in the dark paint? I'd like to add a few more features. So you only get to see this part at night, but if you come at night, uh, I, those two pictures on the bottom show the glow in the dark paint on the, the skeletons or that's actually the calf skeleton and the glow-in-the-dark squid are also part of this artwork. Thank you, Constance and team. Speaking of glow-in-the-dark, we got a little silly with this skeleton. This is Shaq, a female bottlenose dolphin that washed ashore in Shackleford Banks. And we built the skeleton, and Shaq travels a lot. We have a travel box and a boat. Well, she's generally displayed in Bonehenge, in the street side window. You can see it by day, but we painted all the bones with glow in the dark paint and mounted a black light on the window frame that you see above the skull. And it's on a timer and at sunset it gets dark and the timer turns the black light on. So the next picture is gonna show you shack in the front of the building from the street at night. There it is, I'm not saying it's worth a special trip, but if you happen to be in the neighborhood, you might enjoy seeing that glow in the dark bottlenose dolphin. There's a closer picture of it. That's Shaq. So back to the original image, a panoramic of the inside of the Bonehenge Whale Center. And I think I've introduced you to most of the projects and specimens that we have in here. I hope it was interesting, educational, uh, possibly entertaining, and it might prepare you if, if we're open and you might want to visit, or it might convince you that you've seen enough and you don't really want to visit. But anyway, either way, it's been fun putting this together, and I think that is the last slide. Oh, last but not least. So I want to thank the collaborators in everything I presented. And too many to list, so I've listed the collaborating organizations to which the staff, students, and volunteers who have helped with everything I showed you um, belong. 
This isn't trivial. This isn't just to give credit where I think credit is due. This is critical. We depend on these people. And I'm just so proud of the collaboration being any, having anything to do with it, just being part of the team. And all these organizations uh, have lo lent support and assist pretty much routinely because it is not a one facility, one agency, one person or even team of people job to do this. We really depend on each other to get high quality data and share it and display it and learn about it. So thank you, deeply thank, uh, thanks, a deep thanks to all the staff, students and volunteers from these organizations. And I've heard, I've seen it on Facebook, so it must be true. If you're a North Carolina driver and you have a Protect Wild Dolphins license plate on your car, not only will you like look better and younger and healthier, your car will go faster, it'll last longer, and it helps out a lot in the work I presented to you today. It's our only steady source of funding. Thank you to the people who have Protect Wild Dolphins license plates. You have to be a North Carolina driver, and it brings in between ten dollars and $14,000 a year to support the work that I presented. There we go. So, thanks for your interest and support. And I hope this has been interesting or entertaining. Signing off for now, I'm Keith.